Hello everyone, my name is Katherine Cooper with the Sustainability Learning Center and welcome to our webinar for the month of January on sustainability, Ministry of Environment walking the talk with our guest speaker, Eva Musso. And, and we're really thrilled to have you with us today, Eva. Eva is um, the, was invited in 2007, I guess, to develop and lead the Green Project Green, a workplace greening program for the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, which we know is a government agency with over 2,000 staff. And um, during the course of that, through her leadership, she uh, has now created a program that me measures annually and reports the ministry's carbon footprint as well as an innovative green team program which utilizes the principles of gamification so the teams kind of compete with one another to engage staff in sustainability. And this program has been recognized by the Ontario's, Ontario's Environmental Commissioner and um, Eva was also personally shortlisted for the 2014 Clean 50 Award for an outstanding contribution to sustainable development and clean capitalism. In 2010, she helped the Government of Canada to incorporate a summit sustainability strategy for the G8 and G20 summits. No gazebos involved. And she was she's also a member of the Canadian Standards Association Technical Committee on sustainable events, so she's got lots of experience here. She's also an active volunteer with the Canadian Cancer Society and Fashion Takes Action and the Women's Healthy Environments Network. So welcome, um, Eva, to our session today. Thank you. I'm just transferring the ball to you, and okay. um, you should be able to manage the slides. Great. So I think Thank you, you should you should have control. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Can you all, can everyone hear me? Is that a good, yes, no? Hello? I can. I can, okay. yes. Okay. Okay, good. So so every, let me know if you want everybody, me to pick up Okay. Hmm? Everybody's muted, so that's the problem. Oh, right. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, we're going to take questions, I guess, throughout, so we don't have to uh, leave our questions to the end. Um, and you can either type them in, I guess, or uh, raise your hand. Um, so, and as she mentioned as well, I, I do lead the Ontario Ministry of Environment's uh, internal greening program, which is called Project Green, which was established in 2007. Um, and when it was launched, we really, we really wanted to engage staff from the get-go and have uh, create a program that had kind of a homegrown feel, and also, you know, get people's attention that we were doing this new thing. So we started out with um, we, a couple of competitions. And we had uh, we had some competitions for uh, the the logo design, the name, and the slogan. So if you see there on the first slide, that whole uh, project green in everything we do, and the little um, leaf with the thumbprint, those all came from different submissions to our competition that we ran in 2007. So that was a bit of fun, and uh, I, you know, gave us a really unique feel, but also gave people a sense of ownership over the program before we uh, before we even uh, got out of the gate. So that was kind of a neat neat way to get started. So um, the first slide is a bit of an introduction to the Ministry of the Environment. So this is our, our mission. The Ministry of Environment is responsible for pre protecting clean and safe air, land and water to ensure the healthy communities, ecological protection and sustainable development for present and future generations of Ontarians. That's a little bit about the Ministry. One thing that people don't tend to think about with a, an agency like the Ministry of Environment that you know is a, is a regulating body. Sorry. Uh, we're, you know, we are an organization, so this is a little bit of MOE by the numbers here, which is that we have just over 2,000 staff uh, located in 60 buildings right across Ontario. Uh, in some in some locations, there are very few, and in some, like in Toronto, obviously, we have quite a few more. Um, and we operate about 380 vehicles, so that's, that's a bit about the Ministry of Environment. So... Um, our primary role and, you know, our, our reputation, I suppose, and, and what we primarily do, have done, and will do is to regulate. So we have this role uh, that really is about looking outside of us, so protecting Ontario from polluters and, 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 you know, regulating, making regulations to that effect and protecting the environment. And while, of course, we, we still do that, and that's primarily what we do, Project Green and the program that I run is really uh, about looking inside. And so 
while we do all these things to regulate and protect the environment, we are, of course, an organization with an environmental impact. So Project Green was a commitment to kind of figure out what was that environmental impact and what can we do about it. And this here at the bottom is the vision of Project Green. So that's to lead the MOE in reducing its environmental impact, integrating sustainable business practices, and influencing other ministry stakeholders and citizens. So, so you can see the shift there between the vision of the ministry and uh, the, you know, the vision of Project Green. Angela, can I ask you a question? Where, sure. where did the vision come from? Is that something that you guys constructed together, or was senior management, did they give that to you? How did that vision come about? The vision for Project Green? Yes. So are you asking about the ministry vision or the vision, Project Green's vision? The Project Green vision. Okay, so Project Green's vision, we uh, came about through a planning session. So it was the Project Green team as well as the director of our branch here. Uh, so um, that we did that a few years into the program, so we already kind of had a sense of what our mandate and what our marching orders were, but we wanted to really own our vision. So we had a strategic planning session. And we came up with that uh, sort of internally, but with our, with our director. Okay, all right. And you're saying that happens sort of part way through the session, not necessarily right at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Okay. At the beginning, you. because it was an unprecedented program, and uh, you know, it wasn't the way that government or that this ministry sort of normally worked. So at the beginning, it was a bit more of you know figuring it out what what we had to do and what you know what this was going to look like. And then once we were a little bit more established, we had a strategic planning session a couple years in. Okay, terrific, thank you. So Project Green, uh, we're really working toward getting real and measurable reductions in, you know, in the four key areas of air, energy, water, and waste, and uh, trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, our energy use, uh, the amount of waste that we create, and the amount of water that we use in our buildings. So the next few slides go through a little bit of what, you know, what our accomplishments were in Project Green over the past, over this, you know, over the past uh, six years or whatever it's been. Uh, I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly uh, because I wanna move on to the employee engagement piece. Uh, but if there are other questions about this, I'm ha happy to have any kind of offline conversations or, or we can even talk about them today if people are interested. But uh, I'm happy to talk about more details regarding any of these, uh, these things that I'm gonna go through on the next few slides. So um, the first slide here, carbon footprint. Um, when, we, we, you know, when we launched, we quickly realized that of course we didn't actually know what our impact was. And we wanted a way to be able to compare, you know, our, track our progress over time. So we started doing an annual assessment of the ministry's carbon footprint. We started with 2006 as the baseline year. Um, the first couple of years we did it with a consultant and then we moved on to doing it in-house. We learned how to do it and did it ourselves. Um, and we just finished 2012. And based on that, our emissions have gone down since our baseline year by about 37%. So uh, not something we can totally take credit for because, as you all know, I'm sure if you're doing it, that you know the, the energy grid has gotten a lot cleaner in Ontario, so that's helped us uh, to some extent with that progress, but we have done things to, uh, to reduce our carbon footprint as well. So one of the things we've done is that we've been using green energy. So we started with a pilot program and we've been expanding year over year. So we started with green electricity. Um, and green, and we now started this year using green natural gas as well. And so with that, we, we only power two buildings, but between those two buildings, um, we cover uh, over half of the energy used by the ministry. And that's because one of our buildings, um, one of the two buildings is um, the lab out at Resources Road. So that runs, you know, 24 seven and uses a lot of energy. So between those two buildings using green electricity and now green natural gas, uh, we think that in our future carbon footprint, we'll see a reduction of, uh, we're estimating 4,200 tons of CO2e. Um, I see there are some questions. Should I answer these questions? Um, I think that would be a good idea, if you're okay sure. with that. So, uh, Wendy's asking, um, oh, that's just an introduction, sorry, from Caroline about the scope two. Uh, well, so we, it's primarily scope one and two. Um, we did include a couple of scope three items, which are like our, you know, uh, greenhouse gas from our waste that we've sent to landfill and from our air travel. But uh, we've done, it's mostly buildings and fleet, um, and it's scope one and two, uh, the electricity and the natural gas in the buildings and the, uh, the fuel used in the cars. Does that answer that question? Yeah, we think so. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, 
One of the things, uh, as you know, we're primarily office-based. We do have a couple of really big labs, but uh, mostly, you know, our, our carbon footprint is all about buildings and fleets. So in terms of buildings, we are working to green our buildings. We've got LEED Platinum for uh, a renovation that we did in our, one of our kind of executive suites uh, over at 77 Wellesley in the McDonald Block, if you're in Toronto. Um, they uh, had to renovate two floors of it, and they did it to a LEED Platinum uh, standard. and. We received our designation uh, sometime last year, around the, the spring of last year. And if anyone is in Toronto and would like to see that space, I, I do lead tours through it and talk about what the environmental aspects of it, so I'm happy to do that. Um, we also have the Recycling Council of Ontario's 3R certified for our, our uh, St. Clair and Avenue Road location. Uh, we got that last year and we were the first, both the first building tenant and the first member of the Ontario Public Service to get that certification. So that's all about uh, waste reduction in your building. Uh, we've done a few things uh, within our buildings, consolidating and changing out fixtures, and uh, that's, you know, and partly to, uh, for our carbon footprint, but to save money as well, of course. We have been working to get our staff to start using technology such as the one we're using today, instead of, you know, traveling to a meeting, that they have their meetings by WebEx, that they use video conferencing, teleconferencing, and all of the other technologies available to them to avoid uh, getting in their cars or on a train or a plane. We've been working uh, with some of our external facing programs. We've been working on uh, streamlining them so that uh, they're faster and more efficient, but also they, we've been saving a lot of paper. So moving our freedom of information process to an electronic one has saved about 800,000 pages per year, and uh, it's also much, much faster. And then uh, I think this is the last one, but uh, our fleet, uh, we've been trying to make our fleet greener, so introducing hybrids and electric cars into our fleet. Um, I think I'll stop there and just ask if anyone had a question about any of those. Is that, or I guess they'll type it in if they do. Catherine, is that yeah. clear? Well, um, it, let's, I think pausing would be a good idea. And anybody, um, if you have a question on any of those initiatives, I actually have one about the 3R certified. What was involved in um, becoming cer certified 3R? Um, <clears throat> the program was new when we when we got involved in it so there was a, we were working with Bullfrog I'm sorry with RCO um, as they were kind of redefining the criteria but basically how it works now is that a company who wanted to join um, fills out a bunch of documents that are on their website and inputs some data in about the waste diversion stream so it's a lot of um, it's you know there's a lot of information to be filled out at the beginning you look at your waste audit and they ask you all these different questions about your waste streams um, how much you're diverting of what, and and then you basically uh, they come and they do a, an audit. So RCO comes to your location and does does a bit of a waste audit, and then between that and the the information that you submitted, they kind of give you a score, and so you can certify. Uh, we're certified bronze, but I think you can certify bronze, silver, or gold. Uh, so we're working to bring that up, but uh, basically you have to have good waste waste audit data, and it has to be in buildings where you're having waste audit. So if your building is small small enough that you're not doing waste audits, uh, it, you can't do it. Are you audited every year and is it very expensive to do? Um, your uh, your initial fee, uh, I don't know off the top of my head now because they've changed the fee structure. I think you pay a certain fee and it's good for three years. And then in the intervening years, you, you do have to do some sort of recertification just to kind of keep them, but it's not as much work as, as you know, as it is in your first time. So. So we certified last year, and that's good for three years, but now this year there is some work that has to be done. We have to input the data from our most recent waste audit. Um, they aren't going to come on site, so the physical audit that RCO does is only once every three years, um, but you do have to do a little bit of work in the intervening years to keep up. It's okay. not terribly expensive. I think it was, um, don't quote me in case I'm wrong, but it's 1200 to 1500 um, per building to join, to okay. get certified. Yeah. Uh, Claudia is asking, does RCO do the audit or do you do the audit, so the, the waste RCO audit? RCO does an audit. Uh, so you have to submit the data, I guess, so there's two audits. You have to submit the data from your, your regular waste audits, which you should be having if your building is of a certain size, you should be having them by a third party. And then RCO comes and physically does an audit once you've applied for certification in their program. Okay, great. No, it's, just a, it's an interesting, and it is just an Ontario program, is it? Are there similar programs across Canada like that? I, I don't know, actually. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
I think All RCO right. has reach outside of Ontario, but I'm not really sure if they're running this program anywhere else. Okay. Well, and if anybody on the line has a program similar to that in their jurisdiction, just put it in the chat and let us know. No. Are there any other questions? I don't see any hands up or any other questions in the in the um, in the chat. All right, you can maybe carry along. Okay, Eva. great. So um, up until now, I, I've been talking a lot about what we did in the world of greening. Uh, what, when we reached a point sort of two years into the program where we decided we wanted to really expand and be more about sustainability than about greening. And in part, uh, we figured we could do that through some employee engagement programs. So when we first launched Project Green in 2007, we were aware that there were some green teams for, you know, placed sporadically throughout Ontario and kind of doing their own thing and just driven, you know, by personal passion. So in 2009, uh, I decided to reach out to those teams and we had some focus groups and some surveys and we kind of talked to them to see what they were up to and what they were doing and what they would like to see, uh, you know, from us as an organization corporately. So we heard uh, loud and clear that there were volunteers and they were doing, they were happy to do what they were doing, but they were doing it all on, you know, lunch hour off the side of their desks and if we were going to be an organization that was going to take this stuff seriously, that they were going to want, they wanted um, for it to be something that they got to do during their work day, that it was recognized and, and, and you know, there was corporate recognition and a corporate framework for this program. Um, so uh, they wanted some support from directors and managers and from senior managers. So we took these thoughts and we used it to design the sustain campaign, which is what I'm going to be talking about uh, for the rest of the time. We, the Sustain Campaign was a very iterative program, so we, we started designing it. We had a working group of people from existing green teams as we designed the program just to see if it was really going to work on the ground. Uh, we then went to our senior management committee. We went back to our green teams. We piloted it with green teams. We went back to senior management committee. So um, it took us two full years between coming up with the idea and then actually launching it. But um, we were confident when we launched that, you know, there were going to be at least a handful of green teams that were going to be interested in taking this on. So the Sustain Campaign is a voluntary program. It's a two-year program that we launched, as I said, in September 2011. Uh, and when we did launch it, we launched it under the Deputy Minister. So she sent out uh, a memo and, you know, we had an event and she launched it uh, personally. So people saw right away that there was that senior management level commitment. The Sustain Campaign is uh, a certification program that recognize, recognizes offices for their sustainability initiatives. So, um, we knew that there were some people who were already doing a lot and we wanted to recognize that, but we also wanted to get, you know, create more green teams in other places and bring everyone up to a level playing field. Oh, sorry. So the program embodies the commitments, the ministry's commitment to fostering a green culture and sustainable workplace for employees. So the way it works is that green teams would, would volunteer to join, they would name themselves and they would learn about the program, that was their first task. Uh, and then every month there were new tasks, and every month there was a set sustainability theme. So the teams would do the tasks, and they would get points. So I'll go through uh, what the monthly themes were and what the tasks were, but um, wanted to say here that what we did was we set a mandatory task per month, and there were a certain amount of points allotted to that. We also had optional tasks that teams obviously could then do if they wanted to get more points, and we had an innovation category. So for every month, if you had, if you were doing something as a team, that fell under that category but wasn't listed as one of our tasks, uh, you could report it and get points for it. So the reason for that was because we had uh, some teams, let's say out you know, in uh, our northern region that were running community gardens. So clearly not something we were going to make mandatory for all of our green teams because obviously not everyone can do that. Uh, but at the same time they were doing it and we wanted to recognize it and give them points for that. So we were trying with the point structure to incorporate um, you know, a framework and bring everyone to a level playing field with the mandatory, but then also allowing for that flexibility and that local innovation that was already happening on the ground um, through the innovation category. So this was our point structure. Um, we had four levels, and you, in the first two years, you could only get one of the first two. Uh, sorry, in the first year, you could only certify as advocate or guardian, and then in the second year, you could become a steward or a champion, depending on your points. We had an online platform that supported the whole thing, and uh, the teams would go on and would report their points to us through a system that we had set up. And then there was also a leaderboard. So when you went on your first screen, you saw how, every, how all the top 10 teams were doing, basically. So you could see if you were, you know, if you were only one or two points behind the next team or if you were just outside of the top three, 
if you really wanted to be at the team in the next office over, um, you could see how everyone was doing. So it really fostered that sort of friendly competition that we were going for. Eva, I have to ask you, how important did you think the, the ability of having that online um, platform with the leaderboard was in, in terms of making that transparent and creating the, the, the ability of people to really grab a hold of this program? Um, I think it was key. I, I, we never really thought about doing it without that. Um, we wanted, on the one hand, to have a place where, where the teams could chat. So it was it was only accessible to the people who were on green teams. So it wasn't something that anybody in the ministry or in the public service could access. So that way, we wanted people to feel comfortable to say, uh, you know, I had a lot of trouble with this month's challenge. Did, did other people, what did you guys do? They could share resources, they could have conversations, but also they could see how they were doing compared to others. And I think that was really important to people. I know from talking to people that that really motivated um, motivated actions because you'd go up there and you'd be like, oh, I'm not in the top 10 yet. What do I have to do? You know, how many points away am I? So um, there's just one question about what did we use to support our online platform. So um, we used SharePoint. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but it, it's an internal kind of um, work sharing collaborative site tool. And we had an intern uh, basically develop it so that it, it met our needs of having people um, report in and get their points and it had that leaderboard screen. The other thing that was nice about it, having a platform, is that for us, running the program, at the end of the year, we were able to pull out all those metrics. So you could easily check and see, you know, export a, a spreadsheet and see how many teams had had a lunch and learn on various topics, how many teams had reduced their waste and by how much. So we wrote reports at the end of each year and they were really supported by what we, what we, what we learned, what we gleaned from the, the online platform. That's terrific. Does anybody else have a question for, um, for Eva at this point? Eva, how did you decide what points would be attached to which elements of the program? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think what we did the first year was that the mandatory uh, task was three points, and then it was one point for every optional task, and then I think two points for the innovative tasks. We actually changed the point structure after the first year because we had some some people say that well this this you know this task really was a lot of work for one point or this task and partly that was you know in the piloting and the developing with green teams we learned that you know yeah you're giving us three points for this this is easy or you know we shouldn't be getting one point for this this was a lot of work so we had that iterative you know back and forth with our green team so we were able to kind of say we had a sense of how hard things would be for teams and um, just from doing them I guess. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. And, and these points that we see here, 40, 70, 100, are they cumulative or year over year? Like, I, I would think there were certain things that once you've done them, you've done them. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. They're right? cumulative. Okay. So 40 uh, was the maximum, sorry, 70 was the maximum you could get at the end of year, I might, I might be remembering this wrong. There was a, you couldn't get to 100, uh, even if you did everything innovative and uh, if you did an innovation thing in each category and you'd done all the optional, you couldn't reach Stewart until the second year. But whatever points you had going into the second year, you then added to it that year with everything okay. you did. Sure. And and did you have anything to, you know, let's say uh, um, I've, we implemented something, everybody's using reusable mugs, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you give points to make sure that they've maintained that program or do they get that those points in year one and in year three you're just assuming that they still have those points? Yeah, sort of the latter, I guess. We were just assuming. The idea was really that people would take on these initiatives and then when they saw how easy it was, they would keep doing it. Or in a yeah. case like that with reusable mugs, once you buy them for your kitchen, that's all you have to do really. So. Uh, you know, some things we figured people only have to do one time, but other things, you know, like with, with, um, for example, video conferencing, we made it one of the tasks was that everybody had to have one meeting by WebEx. So the idea was just that, you know, once people do it once and they see that it's quite easy to set up, then hopefully that just becomes part of their mindset when they're um, having a meeting the next time. So part of it was just to teach people that some things, you know, and then just sort of hoping that it became part of their consciousness and their, uh, their everyday actions. That's beautiful. I think that's a great example of how you can use points to get trial around a certain behavior. Yeah, I mean, I we don't know for sure whether those behaviors have stuck, but we just hope so. <laughs> yeah. 
I see there's a question here from another Eva. Um, was this initiative also aligned with the performance of the employee performance management process, such as setting objectives and assessment? Um, yes, to some extent. So when we went, I should have said this before, I apologize, and thank you for this question because it brings me back. When we went back to our senior management committee, when this was all designed, um, one of the things we had asked for, and we had said that we, you know, we heard this loud and clear from staff, and they they weren't going to take on this program unless they knew that they had, uh, they had they could put it in their performance management plans, and that their managers would uh, accept that this was something important. So, we had all of our senior managers, all of our assistant deputy ministers commit that anybody who was leading a green team could have one day a month cumulative to to work on it. So they could, those people who were leading green teams or even on green teams, they had less time if they were on green teams, but they had some actual allotted staff time. So they could then put this in their employee, in their performance management process, and say, you know, this is something that I'm doing and this is one of my goals. Um, and that was really key to having this work out because we, we were told by those people who are already volunteering that, you know, this is, this is all we're gonna do because we have a lot of work to do. So we tried, we tried to make sure that they could get it um, you know, link it with their performance management and in that way that they, they would be more active. That's great. Okay. I don't see any other questions, so if you want to move on and people can put, put their questions in the chat, please. Great. The questions are really good because I'm forgetting so many details about the program as I'm going through it, so it's reminding me, I, I, you know, I really wanted to make that point about how important it is to put it in your performance management process, and I'm glad. Thank you for the question because that got me to say it. So the goals of the SUSTAIN campaign were, of course, to achieve highest possible workplace sustainability standard, to recognize and build on the existing things that were going on, and to reduce, to reduce our environmental impact and, and enhance our social well-being. And then also to develop an innovative and a unique program with buy-in at all levels of the organization. So um, we were sure that we had grassroots buy-in because we had done this with the support of the green teams. We were sure that we had senior management buy-in because we went to them and we got their support. And the other part is the sort of middle manager you know, and director level. And myself and my colleague at the time before we launched it went around and met with all of the directors in the ministry, uh, which was, again, time-consuming, but it was really important, I think, because we had this idea that once the senior managers were onto something, it would sort of trickle down to the employee, but we realized quickly that that wasn't going to be the case, that there was a missing step there. And so we sat down with all of the directors and said, you know, your branch is, you know, we're launching this program, your branch might be interested, you may or may not have a green team, we would find out if they did. And if they did, it was an easy sell because we would kind of say, well, your, your employees are working on this anyway, so this just organizes them into something corporate and they can be recognized for it. Um, and if they didn't, then it was easy to say, you know, well, all these other people are doing it, <laughs> you should start doing it too. So uh, so that was key, was to go out and have those conversations with directors. Yeah, but can I ask you a question? Because one of the pushbacks you often get is, you know, I only have a certain number of employees, we have certain work expectations, and when, do, how do you want us to find the time to make this happen? Did you get those types of uh, points or questions? Not really, and not to say that that didn't exist, but that nobody really said that to us when we were sitting in front of them. I think nobody's going to be the person who's going to say, um, yeah, we're not interested in your greening or sustainability program at the Ministry of Environment, but not to say that then on the ground, the teams didn't face those challenges from their directors and managers. Because so, that's, so you know, you that's think always going to be the case. If everyone has a lot of yeah. work to do, and there just aren't the time or resources sometimes. And so team, teams did face that. I mean, it, it was, you know, that's something that is faced, and I don't really know how you get around it. Um, but we didn't really, we were prepared for those conversations, but we never really had them because uh, I think nobody wanted to say it directly to us. Sure. And, and do you think that was because you are the Ministry of the Environment? Like yeah. if you were the Ministry of, I don't know, cow counting, you might have a different... Yeah, I think yes. so. Um, I think it would be easier in other types of organizations maybe to come back. And even at our senior management table, because we had our deputy there, and she was very committed to this. So, you know, all of the other assistant deputy ministers were then going to fall in line and say yes to having, you know, a lot of staff time. If she was committed to this, nobody was going to stand up to her and say, uh, no, we don't want to do it. So, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of um, optics that go around, and sometimes it works in your favor and sometimes it works against you. But um, right. You know, 
those problems were still faced. I think some of our green teams did tell us that their managers, even after everything we went through to get the allotted time to get in the performance management plans, you would, you know, have a case where you have, you know, seven things to do that day, and so your green team priorities are going to fall off. Um, and that's, I'm not sure how you ever get around that. Right. Yeah. I hear Yanis has, has a question here. How are the different initiatives funded? And where would the team members get funds to complete the tasks in the program? And that's the other reason why we went to the directors is that because they had to be funded from within their own branch. So we didn't have any central funding uh, that we could share. We tried to stick to things that didn't cost money, that really was about resources, but, um, you know, little things like what we were talking about before, if you're going to buy mugs for your kitchen and you're going to spend, you know, 40 or $50 on that, that had to come out of their branch budget. Right. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned, there were staff teams, and you know, if you had three or four uh, branches within your office building, you could you could work together. So you didn't. It wasn't that every unit or every branch had to have its own team. You could work together if there were only a few of you, and you had three or four units working in the same building. Um, then the teams would take on the tasks and would just. Uh, we, it was kind of an honor system that we would believe if they said they did it that they had done it. We had the support of senior management, directors and managers as well regarding the staff time commitment. Um, we had metrics and baseline data uh, through our online platform, and um, and as I said, we had an interactive platform for discussion, competition, sharing of results, resources, and ideas. One of the other things we tried to do, so we set the themes for every month, and we tried to align those themes as much as we could with something that was sort of happening in the world, um, in part because we, where there were green teams, we knew they were already participating in certain things like community cleanups at a certain, you know, in May or whenever it is that that happens, clean our commute months. Um, so, you know, we tried to make it so that you could, you felt tied in to something that was happening in the community. So in October, for example, we had waste, it was our waste reduction month because waste reduction week falls in October. In April, uh, it was our volunteer in the community month because of Earth Day. So um, we did try and align as much as we could, and, and this just makes the point here about the, in, uh, the mandatory, optional, and innovative activities. Um, I see there's a question here, oh, uh, there's a question from Claudia and she's asking, did you have a list of the initiatives or do you have a list of the initiatives that they could choose from um, in terms of the points? So was it almost like a menu, here are all the things that you can do? Yeah, yeah, we had, okay. uh, so every month had a theme and every month you would have your mandatory, your optional, and then innovation was always just open. Um, and so they could look at the, pro they could look at the program document and see what was coming. Um, so they could say, well, we've already done this thing that we have to, we're supposed to do in May, uh, so we can check that off. Um, they could even report whenever they wanted to. Like if they had already done something and it was coming up in June, uh, they could report it now if they wanted to, and we would, we would accept that. Um, we were flexible about when things had to happen, recognizing that maybe some branches had already done one or two of the activities that are on their optional. And so if that was the case, they could just let us know that they had done it, report it, and then they would get the points for it. But if they wanted to look at, so we had a program document that listed out for every month what all the tasks were, uh, which we shared with them. And then every month we would send an email to the beginning of the month with a little reminder, you know, this is what the theme is this month, this is what the task is, and et cetera, et cetera. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this slide is sort of hard to see, but this lays out um, our full, uh, this is the mandatory activity for every month for year one. So you see in year one, we started with launching and committing to the program. Then we went into reducing waste. Um, in November, we had, um, I think, Buy Nothing Day occurs in November, so we decided to make it a kind of a green procurement month. Um, December was about hosting sustainable meetings and events because, of course, people are having a lot of holiday parties. January, uh, promoting health and wellness because that's a month where people come back from the holidays, <laughs> make New Year's resolutions about getting healthier. And then that's... I want to just say about that one, that was where we started to bring in elements that were beyond greening. So January was completely devoted to doing something to improve the health of your employees. So that's where we started to bring in um, social elements as well, and, and in that way we were trying to uh, use this program to start uh, broadening out to be more, more about sustainability than about greening. Uh, you'll see in April it was about reaching out to the communities again, that was more social. Um, and there was, you know, energy and water consumption, uh, sustainable transportation, and reducing paper. Eva, I that, can't remember, were these two slides actually in the original deck because people so are have, asking? Yes, these two slides were added afterwards. So these are, don't appear in the PDF if people are looking at that. Um, yeah. 
Well, is it something about, we could, yeah, could we share though? I guess if people are thinking, hey, this is amazing, yeah. <laughs> the way I that you've laid well, it out. We're happy to share the program, uh, but we just would like to kind of keep track of who's using it. So if people are thinking that, you know, they'd like to know more, I would love to have offline conversations with people. So um, we have had other organizations pick it up and adapt it, but we just kind of like to keep track because it's, you know, it's nice for us to be able to say that various organizations have picked it up and used it, and we have absolutely no problem with that, and I can share it and we can have more conversations about it. But, um, yeah, I'd just like to have a handle, I guess, on, on who's using it. <laughs> Sure, sure. So at the end, we can have a discussion on how they can contact you directly, and, yeah. and sure. yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank and you. so this is then. Uh, your, I don't know if you. So well, everyone can see this though on the on their uh, screen. This is the year two activities, and um, in year two, we really tried to build on what had been done in year one. So. Uh, they had to complete a template that we had given them about what they had accomplished in year one and what their new goals were. And so some of the tasks were, yes, okay, you did your energy audit. Now you have to improve on something that you improve, you know, that you showed us. You have to improve it by 10% or have a 10% reduction in the use of that that item. So um, if you had, you know, in our year one, one of when in our waste thing, it was to go go through your branch and see what your top three areas of waste are and do something about one of them. So in year two, it was. Uh, do more, basically. Do something about the second one or, you know, improve on what you did in year one in some way. Uh, when we launched, as I said, we had we had the participation of Green Dean designing the program and uh, we had done all that work and I was really um, hopeful that we would get at least one team from each division. So we have six divisions. And I was blown away by the response. We had 25 teams join up uh, over the course of the two years, and those teams, as I said, you could co you could you could band together with other uh, other branches. So those teams represented for about 40 offices and branches, and they were throughout Ontario. Um, they had coverage in all the divisions and in all the regions. At the end of the two years, 23 of the 25 teams did certify, and six of them got to the highest level, the champion level. Um, they did this really all for recognition. There was no financial prizes or incentives. Uh, but what we did at the end of the year was we really tried to, first of all, throughout the year, every three months or so, we wrote to all the directors with a bit of an update of who's where and who's doing, how everyone's doing, because we saw that that might motivate people to get their points up when they knew that their director was going to be told how they were doing. Um, we had periodic updates from our deputy minister or, or assistant deputy ministers kind of uh, reminding everyone that we're in the program and congratulating people on how well they were doing and that kind of thing. We had, at the end of the first year and second year, we had have a report that we published each year with pictures of the teams doing their thing and publishing the results and who did, you know, who scored what. And then we also had, at the end of the first year and second year, we had certification ceremonies. So, at the end of the first year, uh, the top five scoring teams were handed framed certificates by the minister at, at an event. And so, that was really really key in motivating people because um, obviously, you know, you don't get a lot of chances to kind of be in the same room as the minister and shake hands with him. And um, even as far as the deputy minister, assistant deputy minister, you know, having that face time, people really appreciated that. And having a little pat on the back from them, getting your certificate, people really responded well to that, that piece of recognition. Um, so this is just a little bit about the results. And as I mentioned, we were able to pull out the metrics. Uh, because of the, uh, the online platform. So we know, for example, that 18 teams eliminated bottled water completely from their branches. And, you know, 70% uh, of the teams did some kind of physical, uh, physical activity. 85% of them came up with a green procurement policy. Um, all of them did uh, a WebEx or teleconferencing, participated in that uh, over the course of the program. And I think that, yeah, this slide again is just telling you uh, some of the things that we learned. Um, hard, you know, hard to read all of it, but just, you know, I'll going through a couple, there were 17 teams that posted signage in the washrooms to encourage staff to conserve water. Uh, there were 19 teams that created wellness pledges that were signed by members of their branch. There were 20 teams that purchased reusable water jugs for the fridge so people wouldn't use, wouldn't bring in bottled water. Um, there were 18 teams that worked with their janitorial services to make sure that they were using green cleaning products. Um, and there were 13 unique and innovative activities done. Uh, in the end. 17 teams challenged their fellow co-workers to calculate their environmental footprint. So we had a lot of neat results and um, because there was, you know, that innovation category, we had a lot of really interesting things and unique things happen and we're 
now looking at those innovation, um, innovative activities and putting them into a document on their own to kind of hand out as a, a guide almost to, to other teams to say like, this is kind of the neat things that your colleagues did and you could do this in your branch as well. That's amazing. So again, There's just so much there. Yeah, this is the metrics, um, and this is, so our reporting structure as far as metrics was a bit, it wasn't super rigorous. So uh, we we added up basically how much money people said they saved, but we didn't, people didn't always report it. So we kind of left it open that, you know, if you saved anything, tell us. Um, so we think we saved about 710 liters, at least 710 liters of bottled water, um, $83,000. 219 tons of greenhouse gases and almost 32,000 pieces of paper. So huge, you know, pretty huge reductions there. And I'll just share with you one last slide and then we can do questions if people have them. But uh, this slide uh, was given at a webinar. It's an adaptation of a webinar that Coro Strandberg did. So they're a sustainability consultant. And they were talking a lot about um, green teams 2.0, kind of how to move from 1.0 to 2.0. Um, I think for us now we are looking at how to move from 2.0 to 3.0. I think that's really where we want to get. So we have gotten there in some ways, but we really want to bring, um, so for example, the structure column, that's one where we really want to um, start partnering with our communications, finance, employee engagement, diversity, HR departments. Um, we're definitely not there yet. Um, integrating into job and business functions and the participation level, not there. Uh, so we really are looking at this uh, this the continuum that was given to us and seeing how we can sort of move ourselves to that, that final column there. That's, that's sort of where we're at. Um, and uh, that's basically our next step is uh, where do we go from here and how do we get into that 3.0 area. So that's, well, that's uh, terrific. That's everything I wanted to share. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so again, uh, feel free to raise your hand and then ask a question or put it into the chat. Um, so either way, we can uh, we can handle the questions. Um, I, one of the questions I had for you, uh, Eva, is so I do of the 2,000 employees, would would you have any sense of how many people would have participated in some way in in this process? Um, not not really. Like we know how many people were in green teams, but um, certain things like green teams would organize a lunch and learn for the branch. So. Um, yeah, I guess it's a metric we could look up because they might have reported on how many people, let's say, attended their events. Um, we'd have to sort of add that all up and figure out how many people actually participated. It's sort of hard to get a handle on that. That's a. I think if if I were launching the program again, I would pay a lot more attention to that sort of thing, to the reporting metrics, and and make it mandatory that teams tell us how much money they saved, how much you know waste they they diverted when they were reporting for points and, and things like that, like how many people came to this meeting that you had by WebEx. So, um, of course, you would never really, like you could have the same 10 people at your WebEx meeting and then at your at your sustainability, your lunch and learn. So it would be hard to get a real count of how many people in the ministry participated at all. Um, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? But it would be nice to know like how many people were reached. I think that's one learning for me is that whatever we do next, the metrics have to be uh, a little more rigorous. Yeah. What about um, the idea of, of a survey? The, the, I know you talked to the green teams early on before you started the process and, and then kind yeah. of built it from there. Did you yeah. ever sort of, do you do climate surveys with your employees and have you noticed any shifts? Um, we did surveys. We did specifically about the program. We surveyed again at the end of the first year and at the end of the second year. Um, but. We've never done a survey with the entire ministry just to see, you know, judge awareness, gauge awareness, and things like that. They do employee engagement surveys, but they're um, centrally managed, so every ministry would do the same one, and then all the re all the metrics get harvested up. So uh, it's it ha there haven't really been too many questions specifically about greening. Um, mm -hmm. It would be neat though to do a survey to everyone in the ministry to ask about greening awareness or just even yeah. awareness the program. For sure. I, I noticed that um, in your numbers, 95% uh, of the teams or, or the bunch of the teams were focusing on green procurement. Mm -hmm. um, but, but was that sort of outside your your procurement, you know, looking at 3.0 and thinking about, you know, that would be a more institutional framework if it was part of your procurement policies and procedures. It, it, was it outside of that or? Um, it was outside of that, yeah. There, There is a little bit of flexibility in our procurement policies that you can 
choose uh, the more environmentally friendly option as long as it's kind of within a certain percentage of the price range. So it was more that where they, where they were allowed to, could they choose a greener product? So if you were using paper uh, that was 50% recycled, you know, what would it take to move to 100% recycled? Or something like that that didn't uh, break any rules about procurement, but it was more like uh, office supplies. And we do have our vendor of record for office supplies does offer a lot of green products. So it was more to get people to think about that kind of thing. Okay. All right. I see Liz has a question. She's asking, do you have any suggestions on how to move an organization to adopt some of these environmental initiatives, including green teams, if upper management isn't really on board? They don't consider this a top priority. Um, that's a tough one. I don't, I, I really think upper management commitment is key. Maybe if you even have just one person in your upper management who can act as a champion and can sort of bring it to other people's attention. We have a lot of initiatives here um, that happen that way, that there is one person championing it. Um, I think I would think more about ways to make it a make it not a top priority necessarily, but make it make the case to your senior management. So what we tried to do is, you know, with the surveys of green teams was to get people's um, Bring some, be able to bring something to senior management and say, like, okay, look, guys, you know, uh, there are this many people clamoring for this out there. Uh, so uh, you can do this to improve your recruitment and retention, to increase morale. You know, so we, we try different ways to kind of make this a priority. Um, I don't know that you can really have a hugely successful program if, you're, if your senior managers just don't care about it. Yeah. I don't know. If okay. anyone else has, yeah, if anyone else has an answer... <laughs> Better one than that. I, I think um, you know what I I've heard Loyalty One tell their story and and how it was a very much grassroots um, activity at the beginning, and because it did have an impact on really uh, everyone's engagement and their productivity, and, and there seemed to be a groundswell of interest. Um, then senior management took note of it and said, hey, you know, this seems to be important to our employees. Let's look at it a little more closely. Um, you know, Sarah's saying start with initiatives that save organizations money. So that, yeah, and I mean, you know, those were things we took to, when we went to senior management, we were able to say that. This is really important to people. If you want to, if you're concerned at all about the morale or the, you know, retention of your employees, this is something that would really help. Um, uh, people seem to like that. If you can pitch it in a way that it, it seems to be one of their priorities. If your um, senior managers are concerned about staff engagement at all, you can sort of uh, play that angle up. If they're say, concerned, obviously, everyone's concerned about uh, saving money, you can play up those angles. So, um, yeah, linking it, exactly, linking it to other goals uh, really worked for us. Do you have any sense of what the investment of the ministry was in, at, at least, you know, sort of your time? Like, do you have, you had a little team or... Um, I don't know who who was helping you, or was there anyone helping you in this process? Aside, from uh, we have a small team at Green. There's myself and one other full-time employee, um, and then we had a couple of. We've been, I've been, <laughs> always trying to leverage those resources to get more people in. We've had interns and summer students, and you know, different placements. So uh, at one point, when we were kind of getting out, there was a statement. We had five people in this office. That wasn't the only thing we were working on, but we had, you know, one guy who was designing the platform that was part of what he was doing and then uh, other, you know, two other people who were looking at the point structure. So there was a significant resource commitment, I think, uh, for us. And that's why what I was, you know, there are other organizations that have taken this on that don't have a team, you know, of people who they can put to it. And so they've done a much simplified version of it. So even within the Ontario Public Service, there was a group that took it on uh, that made it a lot simpler, you know, had six categories and, you know, one task per month, just because uh, to run it then takes a bit of effort. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's certainly something that's been done with it is it's been done, you know, the principles of it are the same and the idea of competition and recognition, uh, which are the key, um, and then, you know, it's run in a, in a simpler way. That's great. How much of your success would you say would be connected to how well you you promoted the program or the success of the program or, you know, just made it visible? Uh, a lot of it. I would say that, that without that, you know, um, I think if anything, we could have probably been more successful if we had the time to do more of that. Um, I think, uh, you know, sort of even just hand-holding, calling up the teams every once in a while and asking how they were doing and did they need something from us, did they need some support, sending out those emails, starting those conversations on the platform. Um, if we had had more time to be able to do more of that, I think we would have uh, seen even more success. So I think, you know, 
getting it out there, getting the message out there, and you know, the more times people hear about it, the better, I think, and that that really helps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, other questions that people might have, uh, we're down to our last, uh, I guess, six minutes, but there may be burning questions that you're sitting on that you'd like to uh, to uh, ask Eva while well, we've got her, because this is such a fabulous, fabulous program. How many years has it been? Did you say it was five years? Two years, two years. Two years, wow. So I mean, all I, of I'm this not sure happened. That, I'm not sure you could run it longer. I don't know if a third year, if people, you know, you get a bit of, uh, burnout and fatigue, even with your most passionate uh, greenies. So I don't know if a third year really um, how we would have had to really find a way to change it up anyway, uh, because there's only so much you can do. And the other thing is, um, as employees, there is only so much you can do in certain of them. Water was one we really struggled with, because there's not a lot that employees can do to conserve water. Those are kind of changes that have to be made on a corporate level. So. Uh, could we have come up with a third month? We, you know, we talked about bottled water and having, you know, jugs in the kitchen and various, you know, putting up signs in the washroom, not, you know, not to leave the taps running, but you kind of run out of things that staff have within their control before you have to take them to, like, your building management. Well, that's interesting. So what you're saying is you couldn't institutionalize this as an ongoing program. Um, I don't think so, but I mean, I, I'd certainly, if, if you could, I certainly be um, interested in talking about ways that that could be done. But we decided to just run it as a two-year program. Okay. And do you do you see maybe in five years it might run it again, or you yeah, know, is it, it was the platform for changing behavior, and now that's been done. So you. Can... Um, I think if you, as long as you come up with new activities and new tasks, I think you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because you do get turnover within the organization. I mean, I was thinking about onboarding new people. You know, yeah. how do you bring them into this new? Mindset. And the other thing is that now, you know, we have some members of the green teams that are so sophisticated and they have that kind of attitude of, well, we've done all this stuff now, what do we do next? So I think our, mm -hmm. our thinking right now is more along the lines of what, what do we do next? What do we do with our green team? You know, we have this great framework. We have all these committed green teams with these, you know, names and, you know, who have reached a certain level of uh, stewardship. So what, what do we do with them now? Yeah, yeah, good. Well, I don't see any other questions, though I do see people asking, if they can have a copy of the program. So I think we do a, we'll do a follow-up email. And yeah. um, Eva, can we share your email with people and then they can <laughs> apply to you directly to yeah. maybe great. get a copy of whatever materials you have? Definitely, that'd be great. That would, okay, that's super. And and I can't thank you enough. This is such a great program. And I just, I love how you, you know, it was well organized and you put some thought into what was working and what didn't work. and. Um, uh, this this was really a, a great discussion that we've had here, um, and uh, it's just thank you, thanks to everybody for coming as well. So this is kind of um, uh, and, and Wendy Ferlot is on the line as well, and, and Wendy and I have been running this sort of um, sustainability engagement um, network dialogue that we've been running for the last year, and we're just in the process of surveying people about the focus of it for the next year. And we're thinking that more of this kind of thing will happen, where you guys will bring forward pieces of your program, your whole program, your problems, and um, and come to the network and say, okay, here's some great stuff I've done, or here's a problem I'm having, and uh, and we'll pitch them at these monthly sessions. So uh, this is a great sharing example of, of how you could bring your program to bear and people can learn from it and uh, build what they're currently doing. So in the follow-up email, there will be Eva's email, there will be a um, survey link asking you to go into there and, and um, tell us what you'd like to see in these monthly um, sustainability engagement network dialogue sessions. And um, yeah, and I think that's it. We'll be asking you some, for some feedback on this session as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And um, again, uh, thank you, Eva, for what a, a really wonderful and well put together program and an assessment and the story sharing of that program. Thanks. And wonderful. Thank you. I can see why you won some awards. And it would be interesting to see, you know, where it does go next and looking at that 3.0. So uh, that will be terrific. Yes, I'll be interested to see what we do as well. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye.